fifty, a uh, few minutes delayed. But I thought we will allow all our dear friends to come in who have taken the trouble to attend the uh, lecture today. This audience is very beloved because you know we are resuming our Azim Premji University's public lecture series after more than two and a half years. Uh, some of you who attended our lectures before might recall that the last time we had our public lecture like this was in February 2020, and then the pandemic hit us. And it's a very special day that uh, we decided that we will begin our lecture today. So actually, the public lecture series began in 2011, almost uh, coinciding with the time when Azim Premji Foundation established the Azim Premji University. And since then, we've had a number of distinguished people come here, give us lectures. The venues may change from time to time. They, it's been at the Mother Tekla Auditorium earlier. It's been at the BIC. It's been at Bharatiya Vidya Bhavan and other places. But the spirit and the core purpose is always the same, that as a foundation, we said, how do we bring uh, a variety of uh, views and discussions across to the public through the means of this uh, public lecture series? So you can imagine how delighted we are that we have today uh, the resumption of normal service, if I may use the expression, through the presence of uh, Dr. Sanjay Baru. Uh, Dr. Sanjay Baru, as you all know, is a distinguished economist, uh, political analyst, uh, editor, and a prolific writer. Uh, he's been uh, the editor of uh, a number of leading publications and magazines, and also, as you well know, uh, was the media advisor to our Prime Minister Manmohan Singh during UPA 1. Um, if I read out correctly, he is now the Distinguished Fellow United Service Institution of India. Uh, but all this is beside what I want to share with you, that Dr. Baru, through his prolific writings, has given us a number of books. Uh, all of you will readily recall his book on Narasimha Rao, uh, Prime Minister, former Prime Minister Narasimha Rao, and also Accidental Prime Minister, which he wrote, uh, bringing it from his times when he was media advisor at the, the Prime Minister then. Uh, his latest book in 2022 is 75 Years of Indian Economy. And this is a book that is slim, but like all his other writings, lucid, jargon-free, and talks to the reader in a manner that is very special to Dr. Baru. He's got a style that connects with us, and it's the same style with which he speaks. Today, from his vantage ringside seat and deep understanding, he will talk to us on um, India and the world uh, geopolitical and economic challenges. Before I hand over the mic to Dr. Podium, in fact, to Dr. Baru and invite him over to speak to us, I cannot uh, resist but mention that um, how gracious and readily he has agreed to uh, be here with us. When I reached out to Dr. Baru and uh, said, will you please uh, come and resume services for us, be, do us the honor of being the first speaker after we resume a public lecture series, he replied to me in precisely 25 seconds on the email. And uh, I'm not exaggerating. Um, I pride myself on being reasonably prompt on emails, but he's in a league of his own. Um, it's the same with our WhatsApp exchanges. So much of our exchanges in arranging all this has been done very simply through emails and WhatsApps. The one time when I spoke to him, he touched my heart, and I must mention this to you. I said, Dr. Baru, you're coming from Delhi, you're doing this lecture on Saturday, do you mind, Sanjay, if you would talk to our students on Friday, which was yesterday? And Dr. Baru replied to me saying, Girizar, I have never, ever refused an opportunity to speak to our students. So in addition to all those things I said to you about Dr. Baru, he's also teacher Baru. So over to you, Sanjay. Welcome here. And it's a pleasure and honor to welcome you. And you have a... Thank you. Thank you, sir, for those very kind words and generous introduction. Those of you who are at the back may want to come a little forward so I can make some eye contact. Uh, I started my life as a teacher. And like all teachers, I insist on looking into my audience eyes, which is why when I was asked if I have a PowerPoint presentation, I said I never use PowerPoints. Power corrupts and PowerPoints corrupt absolutely. Uh, because when you are using PowerPoint, the audience looks at the screen and not at the speaker. So I always value eye contact so that I know that I'm making sense. Otherwise, it's better to stop and 
go out and have a drink. Um, let me begin by saying that um, the reason I chose uh, this particular topic for today's lecture is because once again, and I'll explain why I say once again, the link between our economic performance and our global uh, challenges uh, is becoming manifest. We went through a long period when we had a, a more or less inward looking economy, um, reduced our dependence on the outside world, and tried to pursue economic growth um, more or less based on our own steam. Then we opened up in 1991 under the leadership of Prime Minister Narasimha Rao and Dr. Manmohan Singh. And as has just been mentioned, I have a book called 1991, which goes into great detail in what happened just in that one year, from 1st January to 31st December. And as a consequence of that opening up, um, our relations with the world changed. The world itself changed. The Soviet Union collapsed. Um, our most important strategic partner disappeared. We had to establish new re relations with the outside world, and uh, particularly with the United States, but also with the European Union, with Japan, with Korea, and with our neighbors, uh, not just in South Asia, but in Asia as a whole. And therefore, it was a moment when geopolitics and economics came together in a very intimate manner. I don't, that's not the subject of my talk today, but I have a whole book on that, how the two played into each other in 1991. We were fortunate that from 1991 till 2025, for 25 years, we did reasonably well, better than we did in the previous 25 years. The world did reasonably well. And um, became more and more welcoming. We established new relationships with the outside world, and those relationships helped us uh, in strengthening our own economic capability. Bangalore, of course, one of the standing examples of the beneficiaries of the process, the Y2K challenge, the rise of the IT sector, the globalization of India's IT and software technology personnel, and the global discovery of India through IT. I remember my, when I went to China for the first time in 1994, um, very few of the Chinese I met were interested in talking to me about India. But when I went back in 2002, almost everybody would say, oh, Hindu, which is the Chinese for Indian. Hindu, I would say, yes. IT, I would say, no. Uh, so Hindu became IT by 2002. And uh, I then wrote a paper called The Strategic Consequences of India's Economic Performance, which then became the title of a book of essays. And it attracted global attention, and attention in India and abroad. I was invited to speak on it all over the world, because the world was beginning to understand that link between India's economic rise is growing geopolitical importance. The concept of a rising India did not exist in the 20th century. It suddenly became a term that people started using again and again. And I'll give you three numbers. I always uh, ask students, especially of in my audience to always remember these three numbers. Actually, there are four numbers. The first number is that from 1900 to 1950, the first half of the 20th century, we grew by around 0.5 to 0.7%. In the next 30 years, from 1950 to 1980, we grew at the rate of 3.5%, average annual growth. From 1980 to 2000, we grew at the average annual growth rate of 5.5%. And from 2000 to 2015, it was 7.5%. 0.5, 3.5, 5.5, 7.5. That was the story of rising India. In the year 2007, 
a lifelong skeptic of India, Lee Kuan Yew, who was deeply disappointed by India for a variety of reasons, wrote an essay in the Forbes magazine in which he, he said that 21st century is Asia's century and Asia is like a jet engine, like a jet plane rising with two solid engines, China and India. 2007. Today, if you had a jet engine where one engine was India and one engine was China, the plane will go in circles. <laughs> because one engine is firing at $17 trillion of GDP and we are at $3 trillion. This phenomenal growth of China, which was the same at the same stage in terms of GDP and general manufacturing and other capabilities in 1980. 40 years later is five times bigger than India. But even in 2007, we were seen as a rising India. Manmohan Singh used to often say in many of his speeches, the world wants India to do well, our problems are at home. That was the general understanding. And the world wanted India to do well for two reasons. One, because the world was becoming increasingly worried about China's rise and did not know how to deal with it. And two, because India was a growing economy and this India's market was growing, the market opportunities were growing, the investment opportunities were growing. And so the world wanted India to do well. But our problems were at home, whether it was education, uh, urban development, infrastructure, law and order, inequality, etc., etc. All our problems are domestic. India's share of the, the share of trade in national income went up almost doubled within a decade, going up to 50% by the turn of the century or by 2010. India's share of world trade, merchandise trade, went up from 0.5% in 1990 to 2.5% 2 by 2015. So here was a country that was rising rapidly, that was seen as catching up with China, that was seen as a great success story. And all of that was made possible by a global environment that was hospitable. And the interaction between global geopolitics and our economic development was such that it facilitated India's rise. Nobody saw India as a threat. In fact, that was the other point Lee Kuan Yew made. Uh, he said, why is it that everybody is worried about China's rise, but nobody is worried about India's rise? And for someone like Lee Kuan Yew to say that was, was a significant uh, remark. And, and that idea you know, resonated across the world. When George Bush met Manmohan Singh for the first time on the ramparts of the Kremlin in May 2005, the 50th anniversary of the end of the war, he introduced his wife to Manmohan Singh by saying, here is a India's Prime Minister, he's a Sikh, that's why he wears a turban. His president is Muslim, his party president is Christian, and India has 80% Hindus, and it's a democracy, and they're doing well. And Laura Bush was kind of all smiles, and you know, this was in the Kremlin with Putin and others all standing there, right? So that was, I call the golden age for India. What has gone wrong? Why is it that I, I at least, do not feel as confident today as I did at that point in time. And that will be the focus of, of, of my talk today. First of all, 3.5, 5.5, 7.5. In the last five years, there are different estimates and someone like Dr. Chiranjeev said here probably give us a better lecture on those statistics. But whatever the differences in the numbers and the debate on the statistics, uh, almost everybody has agreed that we have not recorded 7.5 average in the last five years. If anything, it's more likely to be below 6%. The latest numbers, 2019 to 2023, is 3.8%. 
which includes the impact of COVID, it includes the impact of demonetization, it includes, includes the impact of the war and the rising oil prices, etc., etc. So we are in bad number territory. And that's a matter of concern. Inflation is still high. Unemployment levels are still high. And uh, foreign exchange reserves are going down. Exports are not picking up. While imports are sharply rising, the current account deficit is rising. Fiscal deficit remains high despite GST collections. And the government's ability to spend is getting increasingly tightened. As a consequence, India's defense requirements are seriously come under challenge. As was mentioned in the introduction, I now am a fellow at the United Service Institution of India, which is India's oldest think tank. It's the think tank of the Indian Armed Forces. It's been around for 150 years. And some of our best uh, senior people from the Armed Forces uh, are there. And from what I hear from all of them, there's great concern within the Army, within the Navy, within the Air Force of reduced financial allocation for defense. It has consequences. So fiscal impact on defense expenditure has geopolitical consequences. How do you deal with China? How do you deal with Pakistan? How do you deal with other pressures uh, around? So there is a slowdown, a fiscal uh, pressure, and um, what Keynes used to say, expectations are not particularly optimistic. And expectations make a difference because if you expect tomorrow to be better, you end up spending more in the hope of earning more. And therefore, tomorrow would be better because there is more spending, the economy picks up. If you expect tomorrow to be worse or not too good, you save, you cut down on your spending, you hold back on investment, and that reduces income. This is a simple idea from Keynes, and that is precisely the situation we are now caught in, where expectations shaped by this experience, demonetization, COVID, inflation, unemployment, this experience is, in my judgment, causing reduced expectations. I published a book last year, uh, which was a set of essays called um, Post-COVID Econ Indian Economy, um, in which I had people both from government and from outside write for the book. So I had Rajiv Kumar, who was Deputy Chairman of the Niti Aayog, Vivek Debroy, who is Chairman of the Prime Minister's Economic Advisory Council, Amitabh Kant, uh, who is uh, uh, CEO of Niti Aayog. So the guys in government, so if the book is not one-sided. I had all, all opinions in that book. But a central idea that comes through a lot of the essays that were published in that book was that uncertainty has gone up. There is a, a policy uncertainty index, which is computed by an outfit in the US. Um, and if you see those numbers, it had sharply gone up. Uh, unfortunately, I didn't write down those numbers, but if you look at that book, I have produced the data. Now, given this uh, wider economic situation, how does the contemporary geopolitical situation impact it? Just as the world economy was recovering from COVID and the uncertainty generated by COVID, we had the Russian invasion of Ukraine. The Russian invasion of Ukraine has had two or three consequences for the global economy. The first and the most important consequence was the increase in oil prices. The increase in oil prices at any point in time results in a one-time loss of income of the country that is dependent on imported oil. So when oil prices went up from 77 barrels per, uh, dollars per barrel to 120 dollars per barrel, within a space of two months, you can imagine the total loss of national income India felt, because India is dependent for imported oil for 80 to 90 percent. 80 to 90 percent 
of all our oil, oil is imported. And just a sharp increase in oil price resulted in a collapse of India's national income because that money has just gone out importing the oil. That is a direct consequence. Fortunately, the increase in food prices that happened as a result of the uh, invasion did not directly impact us as much because our agricultural situation was better and we were not dependent on imported wheat or rice or other commodities as much. We even tried to export some. The second impact of the Russian invasion of Ukraine was the imposition of economic sanctions by the United States, European Union, and Japan. Primarily the United States. Almost every single sanction, the first step was taken by the US. Next morning, EU would respond. By next evening, Japan would respond. So the agenda was set by the US. And US would arm twist. Fortunately for US, Angela Merkel lost the election and showed came in and Scholl was someone whose arms could be twisted unlike that of Angela Merkel and Germany fell in line. Fortunately for the US, Shinzo Abe stepped down, stepped down, Kishida became Prime Minister, Suga was defeated and Kishida is another politician whose arms could be twisted. So you now have, oh, of course in London you have had a joker whose arms and legs could be twisted and you know finally is out. And the same in Australia. So all these allies had weak leaders and the US twisted all their arms and made sure that the sanctions that they had devised, systematically devised. There are now very good studies on the conceptualization and implementation of the economic sanctions. They were aimed at crippling the Russian economy directly, but the global impact was phenomenal. I mentioned earlier what was called the Economic Policy Uncertainty Index. As a consequence of the economic sanctions imposed by the US, the index number of the Economic Policy Uncertainty Index went up from 222 in the year 2021, before the war, to, 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 to sorry, uh, 316 in 2022 till June, first half of first half of uh, 2022, January to June. So from 222, the number went up to 360. Now, just as a digression, how is this index constructed? What this institution does in the US is to look at uh, the incidence of the word uncertainty and reportage and commentary on uncertainty across the world in all major publications. So they take the top three or four newspapers and magazines in the US, in Europe, in Japan, all the major OECD countries, and look at how uncertainty is being reported. The sharp increase, more and more people are talking about uncertainty or writing about uncertainty, then the index numbers goes up. So it does an increase from 222 to 316. Now, The indirect effect of these measures was to create global uncertainty because countries were not sure. We were told don't buy Russian oil. We were told don't pay for it in dollars. Other country, companies around the world were told if you buy, sell or buy anything from Russia, then you cannot sell or buy anything from us. So everybody started hedging and that again increased global uncertainty. Then for the first time, for the first time in history, a central bank was targeted by the Basel a Bank of International Settlements, which blacklisted the Russian central bank and said nobody outside of Russia can deal with the Russian central bank. And the significance of this is that right through the Second World War, the Bank of International Settlements did not target German Central Bank. Hitler was not targeted, but Putin was targeted. So you had, you know, a horrific war, and yet Hitler could 
you know, have continued to do his you know, monetary transactions with the rest of the world, while Putin was prevented from conducting these financial tra transactions. The SWIFT system came under doubt, though there has been some softening and stepping back on that. All of this, if you talk to people who are in, in the business of thinking about conflict, they have now come around to the conclusion that we are now in an era of what you know, chaps in the forces call grey zone conflict. In other words, war is not being conducted through actual armed engagement. No US soldier is dying, whether in Russia or anywhere. The US has withdrawn from Afghanistan, it has stepped out of Middle East. You know, there is no American soldier dying. But the American system is squeezing countries around the world. And therefore, economic instruments are being used as weapons. Uh, I think it was Raghuram Rajan who coined that phrase as weapons of mass destruction, WMD, like chemical <laughs> weapons and nuclear weapons. Economic instruments are being used as weapons of mass destruction. That's Raghuram Rajan's phrase. So we are in an era of gray zone conflict. And the judgment today is that we will remain in this era for the foreseeable future. Certainly the next two, three years, but maybe even more. What will that do to the Indian economy? How will it impact our relations with different countries? These are extremely challenging times and maneuvering our way through this world is going to be, you know, I mean, it's a re re real test for Indian political, intellectual, bureaucratic, diplomatic, and business leadership. Because for the first time again after Second World War, we are now in an era of what is called great power contestation. The three great powers, US, Russia, and China, have decided to settle you know, who's number one, who's number two, who's number three. And they're not going to back off. We don't expect uh, this so-called great power contestation to end anytime soon. It, it has not come overnight. It has been coming in the last few years. The first signal was what economists call the decoupling of the US-China economic relationship the trade war that Donald Trump launched against China and trying to decouple from China, having contributed to China's rise. Once again, you know, every now and then I'll do a commercial. Uh, so my next commercial, I edited a book that came out last year, uh, which is called The New Cold War, Henry Kissinger and the Rise of China. And I invited writers from major countries around the world, from US, uh, Germany, France, UK, Japan, Korea, Russia, India, Singapore, Australia. I even invited a Chinese scholar to write, he couldn't uh, deliver on time. But I put together a set of essays written by very, very senior people. You know, one of them was an advisor to former prime minister of the Australia, another was an advisor to the former to, to Putin, in fact, in Russia, you know, guys like that. Fascinating essays. And the point that almost everybody makes is that China's rise is thanks to the United States. From 1971, it is US investment, it is US favoring China, bringing it into the Security Council, increasing its shareholding in the IMF and the World Bank, treating China like a, like a nominal power, giving trade preferences, and even on occasion siding with China against India as happened in Bangladesh war. The US and China had a honeymoon. And Mr. Henry Kissinger started an organization called Henry Kissinger Associates, which was full of people who either were working for companies and then went into government and came into this outfit or were working in government, went into some company and came into this outfit, 
or were working in some university or think tank, joined this outfit, then went into government or into some company. It was a three circular flow between government, business, and think tanks in Washington. Every one of them was funded by China. The top think tanks in Washington, Brookings, Carnegie, Paulson Institute in Chicago, all funded by Chinese business. So the America-China relationship was such that in the year 2000 or 2002, if I remember right, Fred Bergsten, who heads the, P uh, the uh, Peterson Institute for International Economics in Washington, D.C., wrote an essay in Foreign Affairs uh, titled G2. Can America and China come together and form a condominium and run the world? Eastern hem Hemisphere belongs to China, Western Hemisphere belongs to America. We two get together and run the world. And Europe and Latin America and Africa, uh, parts of Africa will listen to us, Asia and parts of Africa and East Asia they will listen to you, you, you and I run the world. These are ideas floated. Seriously. In respected journals, like Foreign Affairs is a highly respected journal. Anyway, so that was the world we were in. And suddenly we came out of it during Trump's time. And Biden has continued with that. So the first thing is delinking with China. Second step is to isolate Russia. Putin was reaching out to the West saying, don't take Ukraine into NATO. You know, leave Ukraine as a neutral power. And allow me to build bridges with Europe. You know, I can go on telling stories. So at some point, you'll have to ask me to shut up. But I, I, you know, when I start lecturing, I go into stories. So I was in uh, Moscow for a conference, uh, which is annually held by an outfit called Valdai Club, where Putin sits through the day. You know, so it's a group of people from all over the world, and the president is sitting there and listening and talking, etc. It's a unique uh, kind of uh, conference. And uh, uh, the focus that year, I, I think it was in 2019, before COVID, was on Russia and Asia. That was the topic of the day. Whole day, the, you know, everybody is talking about Russia's relations with Asia. In the evening, we had dinner. The food was French cuisine. And the music playing while the food was being served was American jazz. So I said to my Russian host, you know, you guys talk about Asia. But at the end of the day, you are West. You love French food. You love French wine. You love American jazz. You're part of the West. And he said, yes, we want to be part of the West. But the West rejects us. Because the fear in the US is, uh, now I have to go into history, but I, I don't want to go too much into history. The Second World War was a dividing line between the relations between uh, Europe and the US. Till the Second World War, US was dependent on Europe. You know, in ways which are quite, uh, unimaginable today. The entire defense industry uh, in Europe was supplying for American armed forces. The US hardly had a defense industry. It, it was because the Second World War began that overnight the Americans started producing arms because they could not ship these arms. European arms were going into war with Germany and Poland the first two years before the Americans got into the war. And then they started manufacturing. They had an air, aircraft industry which was civilian that made it into military. But more importantly, a bulk of the investment going into US in the period from 1900 to 1930, 1940, or European investment. The Europeans were investing in America's rise, just as America invested in China's rise. Right? But after the Second World War, the US became the dominant power and took charge of, the, of Europe, of Western Europe, created NATO, put American troops in Germany, in Britain, and brought in a nuclear umbrella over Germany. And their fear has always been that if Europe moves closer to Russia, then American influence in Europe will go down. So it's really a fight for influence in Europe between Russia and the US. We have nothing to do with it. Which is why, you know, Jay Shankar said famously, I think this is, went viral on Twitter. Uh, he said, you know, you Europeans think the, your problems are world's problems, right? And he was absolutely right in saying that. 
because this was Europe's problem. Whether America is more influential in Germany or Russia is more influential in Germany is their headache. Why should we get involved in that fight? And the Americans for 10 years were telling the Germans, don't buy more gas from Russia, don't buy more oil from Russia. But Angela Merkel said, look, I mean, I need gas. I need oil. Britain has oil. Norway has oil. I don't have energy. I'm the most important economy in Europe. So where do I get my oil and gas from? I'll get it from Russia. And so the pipelines were built. Nord Stream 1, Nord Stream 2. And this is what was sought to be sabotaged by the United States so that Europe will now turn to the US for oil and gas or turn to the Middle East for oil and gas. America had another problem in Middle East. See the, how things get connected. Everything gets connected to everything. In Middle East over the last 10 years, the demand for oil from the West was going down, while the demand for oil from East was going up. So China, Japan, Korea, India became the dominant four consumers of Middle Eastern or what we call West Asian oil. No longer Europe, no longer United States. United States had become self-sufficient in energy and Europe was getting more and more from Russia. And Russia and the Saudis came together, were dividing the oil market between themselves. So the Americans were again worried if uh, the Middle East finds or West Asia finds that their markets are all in the East, they'll move closer to India, they'll move closer to China, they'll move closer to Korea, to Japan. What will happen to our interests in, in the region? Because the Americans have bases in Bahrain, they have bases all over the region. They fought wars to keep, retain that control. So each of these global incidents is getting tied up, but the net impact of all that, one is oil, that I've already mentioned. But the second impact, which is equally significant, is the end of globalization. The collapse of the World Trade Organization, which has not been able to move in the last 22 years. The last successful ministerial meeting was held at Doha, where a Doha development round was launched and it never really fulfilled its agenda and as a result of which multilateral trade system has become dysfunctional. Just because the Russians went into Ukraine, the US said, no, no, let us try and see if we can revive WTO. There was a ministerial meeting, nothing came out of it. Everybody said it's a success, but nobody answered the question, what did you get out of it? The only thing they got out of it was a deal on fishing, which benefits some European countries. And India was unhappy even with that deal. So how are countries responding to this? They are responding through regionalization of trade. So you have a regional comprehensive economic partnership in, in Asia involving all the Asian economies, and India walked out of it. India walked out of it saying that the, 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 they don't want to be part of a trading organization in which China is a dominant player. That was the official reason. But the unofficial reason was that if we had been members of RCEP, we would have had to accept export of dairy products from Australia and New Zealand. And the Gujarat dairy industry rose up in revolt saying they'll defeat Narendra Modi and Amit Shah. If these two Gujaratis sitting in Delhi allow Australian and New Zealand dairy products to be imported into the Indian market, which is why Amit Shah became Minister for Cooperatives. Suddenly, overnight, home and cooperatives. And if you read newspapers, every other day he speaks about the cooperative sector. Because it's the cooperative sector, the dairy sector, the great you know creation of we Korean, where we thought, oh, we are self-sufficient in milk, we are self-sufficient in paneer. We are self-sufficient in dairy products. But we can't compete with Australia and New Zealand. They have more cows and which yield more milk and, and better technology to turn those products out, right? So we opted out of RC. Then the um, Japanese said, okay, let's try to create something else, you know, so that the Americans can come in, keep the Chinese out. And they said, we've got comprehensive uh, trade partnership, something CPTPP, I forget the full name, so CTPPP, one of those uh, <laughs> five letter word constructs. 
After that was floated, America said, no, no, we don't want to enter because, you know, we are having problems at home. All the workers in America are voting for Trump. If we now get into another trade deal, those workers will again vote back Trump. So Biden said, nothing doing, I'm not getting into this. The Chinese sent a letter to the Japanese saying, we are willing to join, please give us membership. And the Japanese didn't know what to do, so China's application is pending. But we are not in that. We are not in RCP, we are not in CT, TPP, whatever. The Americans then said, no, 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 let us try and form another group. We'll call it the Indo-Pacific Economic Forum, which will look at trade, it will look at uh, supply chains, it will look at technology, etc., etc. The ministers met three days back, and this morning's newspapers, you would have all seen the news. India walked out of the trade talks. They said, okay, we'll do other things, but not trade. So our situation is becoming difficult by the day. Our share of world trade is going down. The way it went up, the reversal. Finally, what about global institutions? The United Nations Security Council has been completely um, made irrelevant after the Russian invasion of Ukraine. Nobody talks to anybody, nothing gets voted. Because all the three contenders, Russia, China, America, are all three veto powers. So each one vetoes the other and therefore nothing happens. Multilateral institutions, the Chinese uh, created the Asian Infrastructure Investment Board and the uh, BRICS New Development Bank. But the Chinese economy is in trouble after COVID. So they're not able to give enough money to these institutions to pump money out. IMF World Bank, the less said the better. Not only have their resources shrunk, their capacities have shrunk, their leadership has become mediocre. There's a woman called Kristalina Georgieva who lobbied her way to become head of the IMF. From whatever I know of her, one of the most incompetent MDs the fund has ever had. And so on and so forth. So then we have G20. G20 was the last successful international organization because it solved the 2008-2009 transatlantic financial crisis by creating new institutions, new funding systems to then revive you know, the financial sector in Europe, to revive the financial sector in the US, and to generally you know, revive global economic growth. And it had three successful summits in Washington, Pittsburgh, and London. So everybody said, my God, finally we've got some group that now works. This is the executive uh, board of the global system and the G20 will now provide leadership. After 2015, the G20 has done nothing. Indonesia is now going to host the G20 summit in uh, October. Nobody knows who will attend it because Putin has said, I'll attend it and the rest of the world doesn't know what to do. The Americans don't know whether they should be there, the Europeans don't know whether they should be there, the Japanese don't know whether they should be there. So the ja Indonesians are saying, no, no, he will come into the room for a few minutes when all of you can be out, then you can come into the room and he'll be out, you know. It's a pantomime act. And next year we are hosting G20. If the Indonesian summit fails, I, I mean, I don't want to sound too pessimistic, you know, as it is, I've said a lot of stuff which is not particularly optimistic. If the G20 summit this year fails in Indonesia, I am not sure it will survive beyond that. Unless the great power contestation gets some resolution, unless the West is willing to accommodate Putin, unless they come to some kind of an understanding, they're all right. Uh, you take half of Ukraine, leave the other half and that will not join NATO. Some compromise formula on Ukraine, which Biden will find very difficult till his own election is over. 
which is in 2024. And we are hosting G20 in 2023. To expect that the Americans will compromise with Putin before Biden's next election, I mean, I know something about politics. It doesn't work that way, right? So a lot of money is being spent in Delhi. Those of you who travel to Delhi will see lots of constructions happening. We are building new hotels, conference facilities, etc., etc. It will be interesting to see how many of those rooms are occupied. Finally, let me say that the Indian response to all this was, in my judgment, a positive and sensible response, which was Atmanirbhar Atma Bharat Abhyan. I have nothing against Atmanirbhar Bharat Abhyan. In fact, Make in India was a program launched by Manmohan Singh. In 2006, he set up the National Manufacturing Competitiveness Council under the chairmanship of V. Krishnamurti. And they produced a report called a National Strategy for Manufacturing, which was made public in 2000 and, I don't know, eight or little after that. And then the 12th five-year plan had a chapter called uh, National Manufacturing Strategy, incorporating all those ideas. So it was all there. The ideas are all there. When Prime Minister Narendra Modi took over and uh, closed down the planning commission, the 12th plan died. But one chapter of the 12th plan was picked up by Amitabh Kant, who was then the industry secretary, who understood the relevance of that chapter. And that was converted into Make in India strategy. So Make in India is essentially an old idea, which is a sensible idea which is because India's the share of manufacturing and national income has stagnated at 16 to 17% over the last 25 years. And the whole objective of that strategy, of the original national manufacturing strategy and the Make in India strategy, is to increase the share of manufacturing from 16% or 17% to 25%. It, right? So India has to have a manufacturing sector. The second element of Atman Nirbhar Bharat Abhyan was indigenization of defense manufacturing. No major power in the world is dependent on imported defense equipment. No major power. Not Russia, not China, not United States, not even some of the smaller fellows like Brazil and Turkey which have their own uh, defense manufacturing capabilities. Our dependence has remained high. I have advocated indigenization of defense manufacturing for 20 years. I used to be a member of the National Security Advisory Board from 1999 to 2001 when Prime Minister Vajpayee was there. Rakesh Mohan and I were the two chaps with an economics background who were made members and we wrote the chapter uh, on defense industry saying that India cannot continue to have a defense in the, uh, an armed force de dependent on imported defense manufacturing. And as I've already said earlier, fiscal pressures are such that money is not there. So get in the private sector, which we did. All good policy initiatives, but they're not yet bearing fruit. Hopefully they will bear fruit. Hopefully share of manufacturing will go up in national income. Hopefully indigenization of defense manufacturing will happen. But again, this morning I read in the newspaper that uh, sources, unnamed sources in the government and it's a serious story, uh, news report, which I take seriously. Said that unnamed sources in the government are saying that uh, this indigenization program is too, uh, too ill-planned. Ill uh, if tomorrow there is a uh, confrontation with either China or Pakistan, uh, we will desperately need um, uh, imports. Uh, we don't have enough uh, equipment at home. And our main supplier, or not main, but our, yeah, well, main and major supplier, Russia, needs all the equipment it has to fight its own war. It's going to say, boss, sorry, this time no money. <laughs> I'm fighting my own war. I can't spare anything for you. Then you'll have to go around the world, running around the world, looking for guns and tanks and jets and bullets and, you know, all the stuff. 
So let me conclude by saying that the economic and geopolitical challenges have once again come together. And the resolution of this takes us back to 1950, to the first plan, the second plan in Jawaharlal Nehru, which is to put Manmohan Singh on his head, which is said, Manmohan Singh, as I said, you say, world wants India to do well, our challenges are at home. Now we have to say, the world doesn't care how India does, we have to bother about our own interests, which is what 1950 was. Nehru went to America for help. Nehru did not reject the US. He traveled to the US, asked for US investments. The US said, no, no, I'm busy investing in Germany. I'm busy investing in Japan. They are war-torn economies. I'm trying to revive these. They are my allies now. I don't have money for you. So he came back to India because the West did not have interest in India. Then we went to the Soviets who helped us who set up a public sector, created the core public sector. But today they don't have that capacity. Then, you know, we thought we'll do business with China and you know, do a growing economy and that will help us. Now we've got problems with China. So we are in a difficult world where once again, as in 1950, we go back to Atma Nirvartha. I mean, the idea is originally of the national movement, and that's the book I'll end with my last commercial, which is that I've just published a book called 75 Years of India's Economic Journey, in which the first two chapters are devoted exactly to this issue, which is the kind of thinking that shaped India's economic policy in the first decade. And I surveyed the entire literature of that period, which includes you know, things like the Bombay Plan, which was written by leaders of Indian business, J.R.D. Tata, G.D. Birla, uh, Lala Sriram, Purushottam Das, Thakur Das. I looked at M.N. Roy's People's Plan, uh, Subhash Chandra Bose and Nehru's National Pla Planning Committee proceedings. You look at all the ideas. And I was saying yesterday when I lectured to the students at Azim Premji, I you go back even further. In 1896, Swami Vivekananda went to Japan on his way to Chicago. Now, all of us have grown up being told about uh, Swamiji's visit to Chicago and his address to the Parliament of Religions. You know, every Indian knows about that. How many of us know about his observations on Japan? Because he spent time in Japan. And then he boarded a ship from Japan to the US and one of his uh, companions on the ship was Jamsetji Tata. So, Swami Vivekananda said to Jamsetji Tata, you are a businessman, look at these Japanese. They were like us in agrarian economy 70 years ago. They had their Meiji restoration and there's, you know, the revival of their economy. Today they are an industrial power. We must learn from Japan. You go back to India and set up a steel mill. Jamsetji Tata came back and wrote a letter to Swami Vivekananda. I am not only setting up a steel mill, I am going to fund an Indian institution of science in Bengaluru. It's on record. That is when the idea of investing in IIS goes back all the way to that. Then in 1906, another person linked to Bangalore went to Japan, Moksha Gandam Vishweshwaraya. And he came back and wrote an essay. And he gave the slogan to the Congress party, saying, industrialize or perish. Japan should be the model for India. Look at this Asian country, agrarian, traditionally, culturally traditional, very conservative. It not only has industrialized, but when Vishweshwaraya was writing in 1906, the year before that in 1905, Japan became the first Asian nation to defeat a European nation, which was Russia. Russia lost to Japan in the 1905 war. So, you know, you know I, I take my readers back to that period, saying the ideas are not new. You don't need today's new ideas. Just go back to these old ideas and simply do. Thank you.
for question and answers with Dr. Baru. He did a plug for his book, but let me add a plug also. Most of us, if you'll pardon me for saying so, know him as an author of The Accidental Prime Minister more than anything else. That's been the Marxist, and that's fun. Uh, but his latest book, 75 Years of Indian Economy, is just 155 pages. It's a slim book, and I want to read from the last paragraph of a review because I liked it. Uh, Baru paints a vast canvas in a mere 155 pages in this lucid, jargon-free book where data is kept to the minimum. Those four things that you mentioned. This book is a must read for the post millennial generation interested in the political economy of independent India's 75 year journey. So he's writing it for the people who are born 1995, 2000 onwards. So I guess it'll be very accessible and in his usual uh, lucid uh, jargon free style. Uh, that uh, in the coming months, with the revival of the Azim Premji University public lecture series, uh, we have a lecture planned in November by Professor Makaran Paranjpe. And in December, we'll have uh, Mr. Jagannathan of Swarajya speaking to us. In uh, That will be in December, I think December 19th or so. So November is Makaran Paranjpe and uh, December will be uh, Mr. Jagannathan.